I'm sure you've heard of Freud and Freud's work on the unconscious. So us neuroscientists like to talk about the unconscious, the unconscious information in the brain with the metaphor of the iceberg in that the little tip of the iceberg sitting up above the water relates to the amount of information in our brain we're actually conscious of. So in other words, the bulk of that ice cube sitting under iceberg sitting under the water represents the unconscious information in our brain. So in other words, most of what's going on in our brain is unconscious. We just don't have conscious awareness of it. And over the years, we've discovered a lot of things can happen in that unconscious activity. For example, we can have unconscious perception. Sounds kind of strange, but indeed we can. We can have unconscious perceptual processing of colors and shapes and things like this that are happening in our visual cortex and we don't have awareness of it. More recent research is showing this trend of more high-level processes, types of thinking and cognitive processing can also happen unconsciously. For example, perhaps you've had the, you know, the experience of uh, racking your brain to come up with a new idea, a solution for something. You get tired, you give up, you relax, then later in the day on the bus, your mind wandering and bang, the idea just pops into your head. Or the next morning you're in the shower and bang, the idea seems to come from nowhere. And one of the theories behind that is that your brain is still working on those problems, on that solution, unconsciously. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. I'm Professor Joel Pearson. It's great to have you with us. So today I'm talking about unconscious imagery. What is it? Is there evidence of it? Does it actually exist? And more importantly, perhaps for some listeners, does it exist in aphantasia? Do people with aphantasia actually have imagery? It's just unconscious. They have no awareness of it. This concept of unconscious imagery and aphantasia is getting a lot of attention at the moment. There are a bunch of papers just come out. We've just published another one on this topic. It's really an interesting take on aphantasia. But first up, I want to set the record straight and first talk about the evidence for unconscious imagery in those that have conscious imagery. So we've studied this. We've published papers on this, a number of papers. And one of the first ones on this was a behavioral paper in which we had participants come into the lab this is not people with aphantasia, this is people with imagery. And there's an interesting paradigm where we actually get them to try not to think about an object. So we show them the object in the actual experiment and they don't know whether they're gonna to have to imagine it or have to try not to imagine it, like just not think about it. So they see a picture of the object this, and we typically in this study used uh, images of fruit or vegetables. And then they said, for example, in a particular trial, don't think about that. So for a 10 second period, their job was just to push that thing out of mind and not think about it. If that image or idea or any thoughts about that object came into their mind, they had to hit a button straight away and hit that button every time they thought about it. So naturally, sometimes this, they can't keep it out of mind and it does pop into mind, so they hit the button. Then what we could do is right after that 10 seconds, we'd flash on this binocular rivalry illusion and we typically use binocular rivalry to measure visual imagery. If you're interested in how we can use that as a measurement technique for mental imagery, to measure the sensory strength of mental imagery, check out this video here where I go into the details about how to measure mental imagery. So here's the paradigm. Don't think about it for 10 seconds, then we flash on binocular rivalry. And the question is, when people successfully push that object out of mind, is there any trace evidence of that potential mental image, even if it's unconscious, that might affect this binocular rivalry illusion. And indeed there is. We see a bias effect, a priming effect, even though people are saying they never thought about the object, no ideas, no conscious imagery ever came into their mind. We're still seeing a very significant level of priming or bias on this binocular rivalry illusion. So what makes us think this bias effect is sensory in nature? Well, we did surround some other conditions in which we sort of ramped up the brightness, the luminance of the background of a computer monitor because they're doing this experiment in front of a computer. Um, and we found that when we did that, it disrupted, it reduced this bias, this priming effect. So it seems that just showing some brightness on the in front of people into their eyes could disrupt this. So it suggests that it is happening in sort of early visual cortex because we can perturb it, we can disrupt it with visual perception. So that was a behavioral paper. Now in a related paper, we did a very similar experiment in the brain scanner, in the functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner. 
So again, we have people lying in the scanner, same kind of paradigm, either we show them an object and they've got to think about it or try not to think about it. And in a very similar way, we're not using binocular rivalry here, we're using fMRI, we're, we're sort of trying to do, decode what the object was or what the imagery was when it's conscious or unconscious. So when they're saying they are imagining it or when their suppression of that image fails and it pops into their head or when they're successfully suppressing it. And just like with that binocular rivalry experiment, in the scanner, when people are reporting, they successfully push that object out of mind. They never thought about it, had no thoughts about it. We could still decode that representation, if you like, in visual sensory parts of the brain, even though they had no conscious awareness of it. So this is, again, another piece of information which suggests that there can be unconscious imagery in those that have conscious imagery, right? So if you have imagery, you can probably have a form of unconscious imagery. There's one other experiment I should mention. Um, again, a brain scanning experiment where we had people lying in the scanner and they had to choose whether to imagine a green pattern or a red pattern. And they could freely choose on each trial and they hit a button when they made the choice and then they had to imagine that pattern um, for a number of seconds. And using those same kind of algorithmic decoding, we could decode which pattern they were going to imagine up to sort of 10 or 11 seconds sometimes before they even reported making that choice. So it suggests there's some information in the brain already that is biasing their decision, or if you like, another way to think about that is that the decision and the representation of the image is already forming before people are conscious of that choice and before they're conscious of their mental image. So this data is a little bit of a different approach, but it also helps support this idea that an unconscious imagery can start emerging and you won't be conscious of it, and then all of a sudden, bang, it does become conscious at some point. So there's three, just three experiments that speak to the idea of unconscious imagery in those that have imagery. Now, what happens? What do we know about people with aphantasia and the idea of unconscious imagery? As I said, this is a popular idea and topic at the moment. So we recently published uh, the paper that I've done another video about um, in the journal Current Biology. And in that paper, we could decode using these similar fMRI algorithms, decode what someone with aphantasia was trying to imagine in early visual cortex, in primary visual cortex, or in other words, area, visual area one or V1, we tend to often call it, why that area, that part of the brain is interesting. Those early cortex areas in the visual cortex process very low level sensory characteristics, perceptual characteristics of things, colors and shapes and angles, dots, these kinds of things. So to be able to decode a representation there suggests that it probably is sensory. Now, importantly, in that same paper, as I've discussed before, we, tr we train the algorithm on perceptual images, so the red and green images when people are just looking at them. We train the algorithm on those and then try and use the algorithm to decode imagery attempts for people with aphantasia. And that crossover, that generalization didn't work. So what does that mean? It means that the representations, although they're reliable at each, each time someone's trying to imagine something, they're different somehow to the representations during perception. Now, some people have said that means they're non-sensory. I don't think that's, that, that data suggests that. Um, all it suggests that it is different to perception. So it could be different in a number of ways. It could be more blurry, it could be a different color, it could be warped or distorted, it could be just in a different part of the brain. There's a whole range of ways it could be different and it could still be perceptual or could still be sensory in nature. So it doesn't mean that the representations in primary visual cortex are non-sensory and high level semantic information, although that could also be part of the explanation. All it means is that the representations in those with aphantasia are different to those during visual perception. So I don't think we know yet whether these representations uh, should best be characterized as unconscious imagery. It may turn out to be the case they are, but we need to run more experiments to figure that out. And it may well turn out that some people with aphantasia have unconscious imagery, while others don't. So all the data we've collected so far really suggests that aphantasia is heterogeneous. In other words, it's there are different types of aphantasia. 
and not everyone with aphantasia has the same um, characteristics, the same profile. That's certainly the case when it comes to multisensory aphantasia, pure visual, pure auditory aphantasia, all these different types. It's the case when it comes to dreams and a case uh, across the board that people are quite different uh, with aphantasia. So it's really up to future research to try and figure out what these representations are during attempts at imagery for those with aphantasia. There are representations in the visual parts of the brain. The question is what's in those representations and should they be best characterized as imagery or unconscious imagery. Now some other people in some recent papers have suggested that because those with aphantasia can do uh, tasks that traditionally we thought required mental imagery, for example, mental rotation, that's the kind of thing where you've got to ment mentally rotate an object and say whether these two objects are the same or different, or types of visual working memory tasks, where you just have to remember visual objects. And people with aphantasia can do those tasks, no problem. And people have suggested that therefore they would be using uh, mental imagery and it's unconscious. But I don't think that's the case, and here's why. When you ask people with aphantasia who are performing these tasks how they're doing them, what's their strategy for performing these tasks, they report very different strategies to those who have visual imagery. So if I think if they were using unconscious imagery to do those tasks, I think they'd have a similar strategy, but they have very different strategies. Their strategies are described in really non-sensory, non-imagery strategies that involve a range of other types of uh, approaches. So I don't think those, those evidence, those, those studies speak to unconscious imagery in aphantasia. So in sum, unconscious imagery seems to exist for those that have conscious imagery. When it comes to aphantasia, is there unconscious imagery? The real answer we don't know yet. There is some evidence from the brain scanning data we've done that suggests there might be, but we need further research, further experiments to really unpack that and tell us if those representations in early visual cortex are best classified as imagery or something else. So that's it, my friends. I hope this update about unconscious imagery was helpful. If you like hearing about the brain and the mind and mental imagery, aphantasia, Please subscribe, uh, follow me on uh, Instagram or TikTok if you want to hear sort of short versions of these updates that I do more regularly. Um, also, uh, follow us on the newsletter, the lab newsletter. The link to that should be in the description. And until next time, stay curious, stay interested in your own mind and how it works. And the best of luck in everything you're doing this week. See you soon.